Addiction Podcast, a podcast where we go one-on-one with fiction creators, such as authors, filmmakers, actors, songwriters, and more. Each episode, we get the inside scoop on our guests' creative process, the ups and downs of their industries, and our guests also give out tips and tricks that help them become successful. And now, let's jump into the episode with your host, Chris C.L. Lowry. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Fiction Addiction Podcast. My next guest is an educator that works with infants and toddlers. She has also written two children's books, which are The Color of Emotions and When Maddie Grows Up. And she is also the CEO of For the Love of Children. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Rashida Sewell to the Fiction Addiction Podcast. Rashida, what's going on? Hello, how you doing? Thank you for having me. Good, thank you for being here. So, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your teaching, your writing. So, how long have you been teaching? How long have you been working with the infants and toddlers? I've been doing it, this month will make seven years. It's so always what, been my passion. Yeah, I was say, what got you into that? When I was a little girl, my grandma owned her own daycare. So I never had to go to like a daycare or a preschool. Only time I went to school is when I went to kindergarten because she was the home of the daycare on the block. And of course, all the kids went to her on the block. Damn. (laughs) So she was basically like a staple in the community. Yeah. She was the the babysitter. (laughs) Like, take your kids to her. (laughs) That's crazy. Um, So what what was it about her? Uh, having the daycare and being around the environment that you think rubbed off on you? She was just so nurturing. Like, she cared about all the kids no matter what. Like, it was like every time I went around her, she always cared, even if it was the littlest things. And I'm like, I don't know. And I felt like when she left me, I'm like, did she, like, pass me the torch to take over? Because I'm like, Mm. how can people do this? Like, have And she was by herself, have all these kids. I'm like, I don't know how people do it. And then when I, when I, as growing up, I said, I think I can do this. I want to be a teacher. Like, I love kids. Even when I was like 10 or 11, like, I love babies. I love little kids. I couldn't see myself doing nothing else as growing up. Wow. So what got you into, so what was it about the, the, the younger children that, uh, you uh you navigated towards more than like the older like say high school education and things like that for me it was watching them grow from babies into toddlers into preschoolers it's like you have this one kid that grows on you kid is with you for almost 10 hours a day every day come back they see you again and it's like to a point you can't even leave the room without the kid crying and it's not even your kid And it's like, I always had a passion for like helping kids, like no matter what it was, I'm, I'm, I'm a caring person. So I don't care what it was. I was always willing to be there to help that child or other kids. So you also are a writer. So what got you into that? So my first book, I felt like a lot of kids can't express their emotions It's like when you ask them what's wrong, they can't really tell you. So when I started my book, I said, well, maybe if I start with colors, they can tell me how they're feeling. Like every morning I do in my circle time, I ask my kids, how are they feeling? Their first instinct is good. So Mm. we do colors. I said, if we're we're having a pink day, we're feeling happy. If we're having a red day, we're feeling mad, angry, or frustrated. So when I was writing a book, I said, that's a good way for kids to express their emotions, not only to express their emotions, but to learn their colors, too. Because a lot of kids can't express their emotions. You can be sitting with a child. You'd be like, well, what's wrong? They can't tell you what's wrong. But if you show them a color, are you feeling this color or a face expression? Are you feeling this face expression or that face expression? That's Mm. the way I felt like kids would learn to express their emotions. Now, how um, 
how beneficial has that been in your classroom and working with the kids you work with? It's been very beneficial. Like I can show them a color and they'll, they'll see a color and they'll match it with the face. Like, oh, this kid is crying. This kid is red. This kid is happy. This kid is pink. They'll say either or. Mm. So, th- so did you write as a child or did your writing journey begin when, once you started working with children as an adult? My writing journey actually began last year. When I was oh, a wow. kid, I hate writing. My mom couldn't <laughs> get me to write. She could not get me to write because I didn't like it. I did not like writing. Why not? I, I, I don't know. She always used to make me write. And I'm like, why are you always making me write? I don't like writing. <laughs> I felt like my handwriting was sloppy. I was like, it's, it's not for me. But as I grew up in last year, I was like, I, I want to come out with a book. And I mm. kept saying, I kept saying it to my best friend. I'm like, I want to come out with a book. And she kept saying, just do it. I said, but I don't know what I want to write about. And one day I just sat in my room and I was just, this book, this title, The Color of Emotion just kept sticking in my head. I had like 10 other titles, but this title for some reason just kept sticking in my head and it wouldn't go away. Mm. So I knew I had to write about that. So, so break down your journey. Once, once you had that title in your head, what was, what was your next move? So my next move was finding the illustrator. I, I already had wrote it out, everything on a piece of paper. So I was asking around, like, how do I find an illustrator? So I found this page on Facebook. It's called Children's Books Illustrators and um, Writers. So I began to, like, put a post up, like, I'm looking for an illustrator, anybody that can illustrate my first children's book. So a couple people kept writing me back, writing me back. And this one lady, she ended up inboxing me. Everybody was just comment under my post. But this one particular lady, she had inboxed me and she was like, I can do your book. And she sent me her work. And I was like, wow, I really like her work. I was kind of skeptical because I'm like, well, how do how do you illustrate my work? And like, how do like how does this work? And she told me and I trusted her and she, I gave her my work. I sent her over my work. And she was done my book, like, in three weeks. Mm. Nobody knew I was coming out with a book. Like, only person who knew was my best friend. Nobody knew I was coming out with a book. So when I got the book back, I was when she sent me my cover, I was like, wow. Like, I I really did this. Like, because I was, like, doubting myself. Like, I can't do this. People's not going to like this book. Like, are kids going to benefit from this? And when she sent me my pages, I'm like, wow. Like. I really accomplished this. I set a goal and I really accomplished it at a set time that I wanted to accomplish it at. (laughs) So how did you go from the doubt to the confidence of uh, uh, actually publishing? What was what was that moment like when you basically graduated? It was hard because I was like, I kept telling myself, like, I don't think I can do this. Like, what if my pages are too short or what if the words are too short? And one day I just sat in my room and I just had a talk with myself. And I'm like, you can't keep doubting yourself. I'm like, you have to do this. I'm like, you can't keep living for others. It's time to live for yourself. Mm. Like, you you have a book now. You have a cover. Your pages are done. Now is not the time to back out. It's time to move forward with this. Everything is done. You're doing self-publishing. Everything is put through. It's time to get it out there. So once I got it out there, I put it on my Facebook. Everybody was shocked. Like she went from an organization to coming out with her own book. It, it was it was shocking. It was shocking. I didn't even I didn't even tell my mom. Like, but I was <laughs> like, sometimes I would go over her house and I would be writing, and she would ask me, "What are you doing over there?" And I'm like, "Oh no, just writing." Like nobody knew. <laughs> so you you mentioned the organization. Is that um? The for the love of children organization. Yes. All right. So break break down that organization. What 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 do you do? So my organization is um for children to help them find love and happiness within themselves. When I came up with the name, I see like I by me working in daycare, I see a lot, and I feel like kid like with kids. You got some kids that like just emotional, like you, you can't break down why they're emotional. And every day I feel like I I tell myself, I'm like, how do these kids go home 
Like, we don't know if this is their last meal here. Mm. We don't know if they're happy at home. We, we just don't know what's going on. So when I came up with the idea of starting my own organization, I, I feel like kids need to be around other kids instead of just leaving this daycare and just going home. They get a bath and they go to bed. I right. feel like they need to be around something fun. I feel like events need to be planned for these kids to come to to have fun with other kids, not just being just stuck in the house. Mm. So but with me coming up with the name, I was like, maybe I should do for the love of children because I love children. And when when I first did all my paperwork, somebody had already had the name. So that day, I think I cried like for the whole hour because I'm like, I can't find another name. This is the name I want. <laughs> so I was able to change it to a, the number four. And that's how it came about. Mm. So what, what what year did you start the business? I started my business in 2017. How has the journey of a business owner been? It's been hard. It's It's been hard trying to balance a business and balance your personal life. But I must say that I am doing a good job at it. Mm. How much uh, support are you getting from the community you're in, the neighborhood, the uh, parents? I get a lot of support. Like I just had a um, a literacy event last week. And this girl, I had my sweatshirt on. She was like, for the love of children. And on the back of my shirt, it has CEO and founder. And she was like, what is that? I said, oh, that's my organization. And we started talking about it. But as far as the support, I get support from a lot of people, like strangers, my family, my mom. Like, I, I get so much support that I didn't even know. And somebody always told me, your biggest supporter will be a stranger. And mm -hmm. I... They they didn't lie when they said that because I get a lot of support. So what what was it like uh, when everybody found out? Because obviously so many people are so used to uh, going with the norm. You know what I mean? Just, just being comfortable with what they're doing. You found a purpose uh, to help children, uh, a selfless act, and you turn it into a business and, and you're giving back. So what was it like when people actually found out, like your family found out, like, hey, you you, you have a it, business, you're running it? <laughs> it was crazy. Like, my mom was like, when did you have the time to do all this? I'm like, mom, with, like, I was sitting in the chair writing everything down, but you didn't know. <laughs> and she was like, I always knew you had a passion for kids. Like, my sister was telling me, she was like, grandma passed you that to her. And she was like, she, she passed it to you. She ain't passed it to me. And like everybody was just saying, like you, like I, every since you was a little girl, I I know you was gonna when you grew up, you was gonna be doing something with kids or something that involved kids because they knew that was always my passion. It, a lot of people were shocked. They always they just kept talking about your grandma, your grandma, your grandma. I'm like, I know. I think she like literally passed me the torch. Like I can't see myself doing nothing of nothing else. If I try to do something else, my focus will get off of it because. Children is where my passion is. Mm -hmm. So how important is it for you to carry your grandma's legacy? It's very important to me because I feel like if she was still here today, she would be so proud of me. She would be overly proud of me. It, it feels good to have to like pass on her legacy to pass, like leave off where she left off at. So it, it's a good feeling. So what was it like when the, uh, your family found out you published a book and you actually showed them or they actually saw it online? What was that reaction? It was it was a good reaction. Like everybody was proud of me. Like my mom kept saying, like she kept telling me every day, like, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm like, mom, why do you keep telling me every day? <laughs> <laughs> you literally tell me every day. And she was like, no, I'm proud of you. Like, you're you're doing an amazing job. And she was like, I brag about you to all my friends. And, like, I had, like, one day I left my books at her house. I didn't mean to leave them. I was rushing. And when I came back, I had two books. I said, Mom, where did my books go? She said, oh, they sold, baby. Here go the money. I was oh, like, wow. oh, my God. Wow. I was like, thank you so much. Like, and she's still, like, I still leave books at my house. And I go over there. She done sold one again. I was like, thank you so much. So it's like, I feel like she on this journey with me. Mm. 
Now, yeah. now, now, how important is that for you? Like having that support, you know what I mean? Just having that. It's, it's very, like, it's very important because I'm a mommy's girl. Like I have a brother and a sister, but I'm, I'm a mommy's girl. Like I, I can't see life without her. I, she, she's my, like my biggest fan. Like I take her everywhere with me to like networking events. I take her to like, I, I don't take her to my book events as much because they be in a daytime, like they're on my work schedule. But if I have like networking events, I definitely take her to my networking events. Mm. So, so once you start writing, what, what what were the initial publishing goals? What, did you ever think about going traditional? Did you always know you wanted to do it independently? Like, what what, what were the goals? Um, that did I didn't know that I wanted to do it independently until I had um, researched it and I had bought this self publishing kit from Maui the poet. And I started reading it and I saw how she did a lot of her self-publishing. And I was always, I always thought about going with the company, but I had read that self-publishing kit and I was like, well, it's not as hard as it seemed. Let me try this self-publishing kit. Let Mm -hmm. me try this self-publishing thing. And so far it's been going good to the point where I want to self-publish the rest of my books. Mm. So how many how many books you got planned now? So you dropped the two. What, what's what's in the future? Well, I'm I'm working on my third book now. I have writer's block at the moment, but I am working on it. So how, explain your writer's block. What what's so my writer's block came about with my second book. One day I picked up my book and my brain was just like it was stuck. I didn't feel motivated. I I was telling myself, I'm like, I don't want to write. Maybe it's not meant for me to write a second book. I can't do this. I had got in contact with one of my Arthur friends and I was asking her, like, is this normal? Like, my brain just went blank. Like, every time I pick up that book to start writing or to finish my book, I cannot think. And she's like, yeah, it's normal. It's called writer's block. So I had it for about a month. I think I cried almost every day because I could not pick up my book because I felt like if I don't pick up my book, how can I make this second book? I can't do it. So one day I just sat in my room all day and I just started writing. I, I did, I'm like, I'm not giving up. I have to do this. Like, I want this book to be out on my birthday. So when I started writing, I think I got to like my sixth page and I like I told myself, I said, OK, you getting somewhere, you moving, like keep on writing, don't give up, don't stop. So as I finished, I um, I got in contact with my illustrator, which is the same illustrator for my first book. And I told her, I said, I did it. I'm done. Like writer's block, it's going. I I'd spent one whole day on this book and I got it done. Damn. So what what was that feeling of getting through it? Getting through that writer's block and actually getting it accomplished? It it was a hassle. It, it was really a hassle because every day I was waking up and I was praying to God, like, please, God, just help me with this book. Just let this writer's block go away because I don't like feeling unmotivated because I know I'm a motiva- motivating type of person and I, I can't let my, my people down if they know that I'm coming out with a second book. But what they didn't know, I wanted my book to be released on my birthday. That was my birthday gift to myself. So you mentioned uh, how you found your illustrator. Did you know what type of designs you wanted, what type of characters you wanted for your book? The first one? Color yes. Animals? My first book, I knew I wanted all the characters to be in there, like face expressions, happy, sad, shy, jealous. For my second book, I knew I wanted it to be a brown girl who always had a dream every day. So I, I already, in my head, I already knew what my, when when I was done my first book, I knew what I want, wanted my second book to be about. And I had um, someone draw my character out, which was my partner that I work with. And she drew my character and I sent it to my illustrator. I said, can you draw this character like this in my book? And she told me, yeah. So one of the things I noticed about your book is uh, the Color of Emotion has so many different characters uh, on the cover. They're, they're all shades, all colors, there's so much diversity. And when Maddie grows up, displays a young girl of color. So how important was that 
to have in your books that diversity and that representation of minority? It's very important to me because when I go to different schools, I see like all the different diversities and I look and I pay attention and I see how this kid may be emotional. That kid may be just mellow, just sitting down. And when I see like other kids, I just I just stop and think like, well, how how can I make this book about them? How can I present this book to them? And when I presented it to them, they was like, wow, like that's me. That's one of me. So I always want kids to know, like, all these books are about you guys. Like, don't ever feel like they're not about you. So when I did my second book, I wanted it to be about, I see so many brown girls that always say, I want to be this when I grow up. I want to be that when I grow up. But how can I be it when I grow up? I wanted it to like look looks like look something like them. Mm. So when um so when you decided to uh obviously what when Maddie grows up is about a young girl envisioning her future, what were the what was that journey like choosing which professions stood out most to you that were important for young girls to want to pursue? Um, cause I did it because when I go to work every day, I always hear kids screaming out, oh, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. Oh, I want to be a teacher when I grow up. I want to be a pilot. For me, I, I knew I always wanted to be a teacher when I grew up. When I was a little girl, I said, I'm going to be a teacher. Like, and I asked my nieces, my nieces, they just turned 17 today and they're twins. And I'd be asking them, like, what do y'all want to be when y'all grow up? And one said, like, both of them will say teachers. I'm like, oh, that's good. I never heard twins, both twins wanting to be the same thing. Right, right. <laughs> so it's amazing to hear kids like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up. I, at my literacy event last week, I had read my book and all the kids, they were so happy to see that book because they were just yelling out like, I'm going to be a doctor. Is it a doctor in that book? Oh, I'm <laughs> going to be an entrepreneur. So it's it's a good feeling. So, so um, so you kind of like answered the, the next question. So, what I was ask you, what was the reaction from the kids, and especially the kids you work with when they found out that you wrote a book and you showed them your book? They love it. They, every time I bring the book, they always want me to read it, or they want to take it and read it themselves. So they, they at that age, they can't read now, but when they see the picture, they know the picture of a doctor or a nurse. Or they can't say chef, but they know somebody is cooking. <laughs> so it they they love the book. So what do you think is one of your greatest moments as a writer? I think one of my greatest moments is the finishing touches to getting it done. Because I don't like writer's block. I do not like <laughs> writer's block at all. But one the the most I can say is the finish touch the finishing touches. So as as an educator, um, and someone who works around children, what do you think about um, the the growth? I know I know it's growing now. Uh, the growth of diversity in books for uh, young children. I think the growth for children, I think, is good. Like the kind of books that they got out today for kids, I feel like they can learn from it. And some kids have experienced it. If they're not experiencing it, they will experience it. Like we have so many books in my classroom for kids to just point out. Like I said, they can't read, but if they look at a picture, they know. So I think the growth of books today, it, it's amazing because I see a lot of kids learning from it. Like I see a whole bunch of titles. And when I read through the books, I, you can see that the kids are experiencing this. Mm. So how how have you grown as a writer from the moment when you started writing your first story to now, obviously, everything you learned from the industry and, and your growth as a writer? I think my growth has become good. Like, I, sp I find myself, like, writing bullet points down in my phone or, like, just jotting stuff down, brainstorming. I might have writer's block, but I still can brainstorm. 
And I just sometimes I just felt myself like just throwing a title out there or just putting it down on a piece of paper and then just throwing it in my bag. So I think I've grown a lot from it. So what's your, let me say, your writing setup? You ever, you have any writing rituals that get you focused on writing? Do you? Yeah, when I have both of my books side by side and I just pull out my writing book and I just start writing. Or if, even if I don't feel like writing, I'll just pull out my laptop and just start typing on my laptop. Mm. So what you prefer? Are you a pen and paper type of writer or you a... Or you I'm a... a, I'm a, a I'm a uh, lab type. I like to type. <laughs> yeah, I love to type. So what um, what made you choose your target audience? I'm, I'm assuming your target target audience are the children that you work around with, the younger ones. Because I feel like they can benefit from it more. I feel like that with them growing up from birth on up, they'll be able to take it with them later on in life. Do you ever see yourself writing any other type of books, like any other adult fiction, middle grade, Mm -hmm. teen? I do want to start writing teen books and like teen journals because I feel like with teen journals, like I tell myself like, and I tell my friends that writing is very therapeutic. So I do feel like one day I'll be writing a teen book and coming out with like a teen motivational journal. So through your journey in self-publishing, what's been what's been the hardest? The hardest is with self-publishing, them keep sending it back if something is wrong. With my first book, I think they must have sent it back like 20 times and I've gotten mad like 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the hardest part. Them keep sending it back. And then when you finally get it right, you'll be like, yes, it was worth it at the end. <laughs> so that's who, the hardest part. Who is, it? Am- is it Amazon you published through? Yeah, it's Amazon. Yes, yeah, they got yeah, they they got some weird uh, yeah. requirements. What they yes. <laughs> so does your um your illustrator do they do the formatting too, or do you do the formatting of the book? No, she does everything. She does the formatting. She asks me what format do I want. Like she asks me everything before she does it herself. Now, how how has it been um, working with the illustrator? Is it someone local? Is it someone, um, do you guys like the communication? How do you guys communicate? You sit down and do it or you do it through email? Um, we do it through email. She's not local. She's actually from Indian. So she she's really good. She oh, She's always checking up on me, always asking me how's book sales going. She's always telling me, like, I think you should start a podcast for your book. You should do this for your book. But she like she's she's very helpful. She's amazing. She's very helpful. She's always like writing me, asking me a lot of questions and giving me good feedback. Now, what advice would you give a an aspiring children's book writer in terms of choosing the right illustrator for the, uh, their project? I would tell them to shop around first, like just keep looking until you find that. I'm not going to say perfect, but until you find that work that you like just keep shopping around and like don't just go for anything for pricing don't go for like somebody just telling you oh I can do it I can do it just keep shopping around till you find what you what fits you are are there were there any other illustrators that um that you consider working with that you didn't go with prior to the one you chose um, no, that was the one I chose because like I said, she was the only one who inboxed me, took the time out to inbox me. Everybody was just commenting below. Mm. So how important were or were that you said it was a Facebook group, right? Yes. How important was that? Like how important are those type of groups and platforms in terms of getting information and reaching out and networking? You think in your those opinion. I think that they're very important because they send you a lot, like they send you a lot of Arthur events, they tell you to put your book down here, they um they tell you about like local events or like events that's happening, like if you if it's not in your city, it's in other cities or like book fairs that's going on. So it is very beneficial. Like I love the group. I'm actually in two groups. The African American um children's book writer and the children's and illustrators book writers. 
So um, you mentioned you did a couple of events. Uh, how how how's that process in terms of preparing for them, in terms of doing them, and then obviously searching for the right event for you. Well, my first event for my um my organization, it was actually easy because like all my friends helped me. Like my mom, she she helped me with everything. She said, "I'm going to get your hoagie chai. These kids need food. Like you know, kids like to eat." I'm like, you're right, mom. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> and she was like, um, she was like, I got you. She was like, I'm going to help you. But all my friends, they were all there to help. My family was there to help. So it's like I have a lot of support. But in terms of like finding the right event space, that's the hard part. Like booking, making sure nobody don't have that date. That's the only hard part for me. And like getting like who's going to come. Somebody did teach me that. Don't try not to put your event out there early because people tend to forget. Mm. So that's the only hard part, like booking and promoting. So what, So once you get your event set up, what are some of the things you like to focus on in terms of, um, in terms of presentation for your pro- project and product? Um, I like to focus on like a number of people that's going to be there a number of tickets that's being sold and who I'm going to have there. And if I'm going to have a speaker there, I want, I want the, like the youth to leave with something. Like when I had my first event, all the kids left with something. They all told me like, I had fun. I learned a lot. Their speakers were very nice. So I always like for them to leave for, with something. So what are some, of, what, what are some of the other things that your uh, company does in terms of, helping children in, in some ways that other people can reach out and support? Um, we help with like getting, getting that nurturing with children, like having them, giving them that love they're not getting, that support they're not getting. If they're not getting it from home, then we can give it to them. Stuff like that. Um, we also help with like different events, like, I I do want to start doing like self-love events for my organization because I do feel like kids need to learn more about self-love. If they feel like nobody loved them, I do want them to know that it's always good to love themselves. Mm. So, break, so, so, so break down that self-love a little bit more for them. So what, like, what are some of the things? So what are, what are some of the things you think are causing the lack of self-love in children because obviously there's a lack of that in adults as well and what are some of the solutions you think that will uh, help people get through it i feel like this lack of self-love in kids when they feel like they're not getting time spent or they probably feel like they're not with their parents enough or they're not with this person enough or even if they're not with their parents at all that can always cause a lack of self-love um, them just like not doing nothing. They probably see, oh, my friends, they're always doing stuff with their parents and me. I'm just like in the house. I don't never go nowhere. It, it's, it's a whole lot of things that can like lack self love. I feel like parent with parents not spending enough time with their kids, that can play a part too. Like, I feel like kids nowadays just want to hear, like, I love you. You're doing a good job. I'm proud of you. That's all kids want to hear. Right. Absolutely. So when you, when you, when you break down the color of uh, emotions, um, which is there, is there, was there a curriculum you created with it uh, in terms of like choosing the colors, which colors represent which emotions? Like, how did you know which emotions you want to use to represent, to have the representation by the colors? Um, choosing the colors, like I was choosing like the dark colors because I know sometimes like red, it's like a, a hard color. So that can mean mad. Pink is like a soft color that can mean happy. Jealous is like a neutral color. So it'll be yellow and purple would be for just shy. So how I went about using the colors is how I see when kids react and how I learned it and how it's being taught. So when you break down the the Maddie series, um, the Maddie group, is that going to be a series or is that going to be a standalone book? 
That's going to be a standalone book. I wanted it to be a series because I wanted it to come out with a boy version. I think coming out with a boy version would be pretty cool too because I don't want um, boys. I don't want boys to feel left out. Mm. Mm, that's deep. So it seems like there's a trend with like educators that are also becoming authors. What's the? What do you think is the connection between um, being an educator and also being an author that that basically combines those two worlds? Being an educator, you're like you basically giving children and teaching children something that they never knew. Like I can go to work tomorrow and I can teach somebody how to tie their shoe who never knew how to tie their shoe. Mm. I can teach somebody how to write their name who don't even know how to write a letter. They might not learn it in one day. It's going to take a course of time to learn it. And with being an author and just writing, it, it plays a part because it's like you, you're home, like being an author is like you're, when you're outside, like you're just writing. And then when you go to work, you're still writing and teaching kids. Yeah, absolutely. So what are, uh, do you attend any of those author events, like the uh, author fairs and festivals? I wasn't able to make the Arthur Fair Saturday because I had to work early. I was kind of upset, but I am definitely planning on making it next year. I'm going to register early and I do know is some more coming up. Um, I do go to different daycares and read in different schools to read my books as well. So, uh, so how do you how do you book those type of readings and do the people reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? Um, they reach out to me and I also reach out to them as well. And and how's that like? How's that process of preparing to do a presentation it's, in front of the it's, kids? It's good because I'm a nervous type of person. <laughs> I always have a pep talk with myself before I go because I know like if I'm working with a certain age group, I can't like spend too much time on a topic because I know they can't sit for a long period mm. of time. It's like it it's been going good. So what do you think is next for you in terms of this journey? What I think is next for me, I do pl- I do plan on releasing my third book. I want to release two books this year like I did last year, and I will be having more events for my organization and I also want to branch out with my book like travel with my book. So how how do you think, what do you think about the writing community? How has the writing community been uh, in terms of getting advice? Is it is it positive? Is it negative? They've been like very positive and like very helpful. Like I have people like inbox me and tell me like, you're doing a good job. You're, like your book is amazing. It's It's been good. It's been really good and helpful. And how important do you think is that networking with other authors? Um, editors, illustrators. It's good. Like before, before I got into this networking thing, I was always scared to talk to people. <laughs> I was like, I can't network with these people. They're strangers. But I, I've gotten out that that whole thing, and I was like, you, you gotta branch out. Like you can't keep being scared. You can't. You gotta break out this shyness, and with networking with other people. And it's been like good. I've been like going to like different networking events, meeting amazing people and getting like good feedback. I'll like bring my books. I'll leave with selling books so that the networking world has been it's been helpful and I'm getting better at it. Mm. So. um, Your publishing goals, do you see yourself staying independent or do you see yourself possibly taking a traditional route one day? Is that even in your in your vision at this moment? I do see myself staying in the independent publishing world, but I do want to start my own publishing company mm. for people who wants to come out with a book or a child that maybe wants to write a book. So I do see myself doing that. So why why do you want to stay independent? Because I feel like is um you don't have to like wait on nobody. You can just do it. 
And I feel like it's more cheaper than spending thousand dollars on a company. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's like it's cheaper. So what's um what's a tip you would give somebody that's out there procrastinating? They want to write a book. They want to write a children's book, um, but they don't know where to start, or they just don't know where to look. What what is some what is a bit of advice you would give them? The advice I would give them, I would say, start writing it down. Like, start writing titles down. Start brainstorming, like, writing little bubbles. Like, go to a quiet place. I had to learn that. Like, I've, I've learned that I can't sit in my bedroom and write because I feel like a bed is too comfortable. Mm. I feel like you got to go in the kitchen. Somebody told me going to a hotel is beneficial, like, because it's a quiet place. No one's around. Um, like for me, like when the color of emotions, I had that title like three years ago. And when I looked at, it, I said, wow, I wrote this title like three years ago on my phone. So it's good to like write titles down. Don't throw paper away. Cause you're going to need it. If you're going to be writing, don't ball that paper up. Cause I feel like when you start writing it, you're going to go back to that paper that you balled up. So I would tell them, don't give up. Yes, writer's block is hard. You feel like you can't get out of it, but never give up. So where can people reach out to you? Where can they find your books? How can they get in contact with you? Um, you can find both of my books on Amazon. Um, my Instagram is Sheeta with three underscores. And my organization page is the number four for the love of children. And my Facebook is Rashida Sewell. All right, Rashida Sewell, we appreciate you. We appreciate the advice, your dope story. Keep doing what you're doing. And everybody tune in, cop her books, and stay posted. All right, thanks thanks for joining us. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Fiction Addiction Podcast. Make sure you visit fictionaddictionpodcast.com for links on everything we talked about today, as well as awesome resources, additional tips, and fiction addiction merchandise.